love angels all of that stuff that was on the slide just now is uh, secondary to the fact that uh, I have been a caregiver for many years to many people. And uh, the passion for palliative care really came from the recognition of a lack of it. And I'm sure that is uh, something that many people in this room have encountered in some way or form. Um, I find that palliative care compared to a lot of other disciplines attracts people with lived experience more than others, which also means that there is that much more empathy in this community. Um, so my name is Smriti. I, uh, I'm a psychologist by training, but I've been in palliative care now for 20 years. And this particular series is really just a broad introduction to palliative care for people like me who did not get a medical degree. Uh, when I was a student, I struggled uh, very hard to find programs that would tell me a little bit more about this, this discipline, which is quite invisible. It still is quite invisible. And um, over the years, I've had the privilege to work with Dr. Raj and with Pallium India. And this particular foundation course is just our offering to you. And I hope that this is just the starting point for you, if you're not already working in palliative care, to explore more as you go along. So um, some little bits of housekeeping as we go forward. Um, you're gonna see a lot of me over the next few <laughs> weeks and I'm gonna try and not be too monotonous, but uh, I personally have a request that as far as bandwidth allows, please turn on your cameras, even for a short while in these interactive bits, not through the whole session. Um, I have so much Zoom fatigue from the pandemic that it makes it very difficult for me to connect with people if I'm not if I'm not seeing them. So um, that's my personal request. Turn it on for a few minutes in the beginning and the end. You can keep it off while the session is on. The second thing is uh, the chat box is open and I would encourage you to use it liberally. Um, and it's not just for questions, it's for reflections, it's for comments, it's for observations. Again, another request is, I know many of you are going to find certain conversations we're having, um, you'll find that they resonate with you at a personal level. It's probably triggering some personal experience. It could be triggering anxiety, it could be triggering grief. Um, I'm available to connect with separately on that. And it is very difficult for me to keep track of the chat box when people are sharing personally. So if you do have a personal story to tell, We'll try and keep some time at the end. And I'm very happy to hear from you and share personal experiences, but uh, try and keep that to the end of the session because uh, like I said, I, I find it difficult not to be able to respond to something poignant or important that someone has shared and keep, keep to the schedule of the session. Um, this is not a classroom classroom in the sense where uh, this is a facilitator and uh, audience sort of setup. Uh, we're here to learn together. So from time to time, I will pause, I will invite, um, you know, interaction with the group. And at that point, please feel free to unmute and, and share what you have to share. So uh, yeah, I'm going to keep adding stuff to this as we go along. But th uh, this is just for starters. So um, I will also pause from time to time and maybe, you know, do a very informal poll and uh, do all of you know how to use the reactions button? It's at the bottom of your screen. There's a reactions, there's a smiley with a plus. You can add emojis of your choice. Uh, use that also to raise your hand or to lower it if you have something else to say. Okay. Um, all right. So this session is on introduction to palliative care. So just by a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with palliative care? You can put your hand up or you can use the emoji. Okay, all right. Oh, hi, Sonalini, I just saw you there. <laughs> hi, hi, sorry, I'm in the field with uh, limited connectivity. I'm in a hamlet right now. <laughs> no, no worries, great to see you. Um, okay, all right, so a uh, fair bit of, fair number of people, all right, great. Um, how many of you have, Okay, you can lower your hands if you are if you have your hands up. Yeah. My next question is how many of you have had experience as caregivers or people who have lived with um, any sort of life limiting 
illness. All right. Yeah, I'm going to repeat the question for those of you who haven't heard me. How many of you have been carers, caregivers, and how many of you have lived with some sort of life-threatening, life-limiting condition? All right. Fair number. Um, I am audible to everybody, right? I just saw in the chat box that I'm not, okay, fine, all right, okay. So safe to say that um, illness and suffering is not new, uh, especially uh, to, um, I mean, now that we've been through those horrendous uh, COVID waves in our country, we've all had some sort of encounter with illness or we have, we have uh, witnessed. So there, there is this truth in life that at some point in life, you will either need care or you will need to provide care. And uh, so palliative care is not really that much of an outlier in terms of disciplines. It is probably something that all of us need to, to know about well in advance. And my experience has been that people end up asking for palliative care when there is no other option. Very often hospitals will refer people to palliative care when there is nothing more that we can do. I'm here to tell you that that is absolutely not true. Palliative care can start at the time of diagnosis and it's really not anything we can't do. There is plenty we can do in palliative care whether or not we're medically trained. So um, I'm, not, I'm not gonna take up any more time on just that sort of discussion. Let me just share my screen and let's get to it. Um, Raju, is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am, it is. Super on. Okay, let's start. Before we, before we talk about palliative care, it's important to talk about healthcare because the two are deeply intertwined. And the WHO defines, this is a part of the WHO definition of health. It is not only the absence of this disease or infirmity, it is physical, social, and mental well- so I repeat, it is not just the absence of disease or infirmity, it is physical, social, and mental well-being. So let me stop sharing for a sec. In the current scenario, as we are experiencing it in our country, is, is healthcare what WHO defines it to be? Are we focusing on well-being, physical, social, and mental well-being? Or are we just focusing on eradicating or Diff or uh, you know, uh, curing disease. What are we focusing on? Are we? How much of healthcare is actually focusing on well-being, um, in your opinion? And please use the chat box to uh, to share your thoughts. Because if if health is the is not just the absence of disease and infirmity, but also the presence of well-being, then my opinion here is that healthcare is not being practiced in its in its true form at all. We're far from it. We're focusing only on one aspect, which is to eradicate the illness, the disease. Okay. Okay. Kamla, can you elaborate on that, please? Also, and mentally, mental well being also, do you mean that? Okay. Very few people concentrate on goal rather than the process. We focus very less on well being, mostly curative. Okay, fine. Okay, that's the sense in the room, and I agree with all of you. Okay, so India's healthcare is one of the worst in the world. Okay, amongst the 195 countries that were uh, that were surveyed in 2015, uh, found uh, across various indicators. The link is there. It's the Healthcare Access and Quality Index based on mortality, and uh, you will have access to this link. Uh, we ranked way behind all our neighbors and it was it was measured along several parameters and we did badly on pretty much most of them. Okay, yes, we are doing well in terms of maternal and child health in some parts of the region and there are regional differences in the way uh, India scores, but by and large, overall, we're not doing very well at all. And, oops, sorry, I clicked on the link, at least we know now that the link works. Sorry, hang on. Okay, and here's a statistic that should really, you know, uh, that, that's really sad. And this is from 2014, but the 2021 statistics are pretty similar. The National Crime Records Bureau of India records that at least approximately one in five 
people who choose to end their lives are people living with serious health-related conditions like cancer, HIV, paralysis, so on and so forth. And it's a staggering number. It's a staggering number of people who choose to end their lives because they are living with a serious condition. Okay, so th there is no study that actually links the two. The, the National Crime Records Bureau of India does not really make a direct, doesn't draw a direct line between why this happens, um, you know, especially amongst this cohort. But let me just stop here for a second. Why do you think that people who are living with life-limiting and life-threatening conditions are one in five amongst those who are choosing to end their lives in our country. You can unmute, you can use the chat box. I'm gonna let you think about it for, for a couple of minutes uh, and let's just hear from everybody. One in five people in India who choose to end their lives are people living with serious health related issues. What in your opinion are the reasons for that? Diminished quality Probably, of- Probably uh, a few reasons could be a lack of infrastructure and the financial uh, issues they encounter in their lives and mostly the uh, caregivers are not been enough uh, supportive in terms of mental, emotional and physical uh, in nature. And most of these factors are uh, coexist or sometimes they are independent too. Yes. Thank you, Ravi. I, I think you've covered pretty much most of them. Uh, I can see that there's a lot of resonance in the chat box as well. People are talking about financial issues, emotional support, support systems, um, dependency. All right. Yes, Isha, you raised your hand, please. Anu. I think uh, there is a feeling of guilt that, you know, they're troubling their family members and the feeling of helplessness because they know that their end is coming soon. So, and of course, financial coming from a third world country as well. Absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. A sense of being a burden on the family. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, lack of, okay, I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of that. How about the physical distress? The actual physical distress and incredible amounts of pain, uh, especially in certain diseases. Um, yes, Shilpali, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, uh, the physical distress is the most uh, uh, holds the topmost um, thing that is not being addressed um, in India. Um, it is it is very difficult for a patient to approach to understand. Uh, also, the caregivers uh, they they are not they don't have any clarity uh, about what is actually happening with the patient. Um, so that is that is a major uh, thing uh, with physical distress, and obviously with this physical distress, there are uh, other distresses uh, coming in: the psychological, the social, financial, and obviously the spiritual aspect. Thank you, thank you, absolutely. So there's a lot of unrelieved distress in all disease uh, uh, trajectories. And uh, while we talk about pain being mostly associated with cancer, we know that's not true. Pain is associated with a variety of conditions. Uh, there is also the lack of uh, autonomy that a patient experiences. The minute you are diagnosed with a serious illness, you are at the mercy of everybody else. Your identity is diminished. Uh, everybody's making decisions for you, well-intentioned or not. And uh, everybody's an expert on your life. Uh, so that sense of autonomy is taken. And we're all guilty of it. When somebody we love and care about is diagnosed with any illness, irrespective of their physical capability, don't we all rush in to do stuff for them? Let me get you a glass of water. No, why don't you sit down? Let me do it for you. So even if someone is capable of looking after themselves, we make them feel more, more like a patient than they did before. So that sense of autonomy, and I will emphasize the sense of dignity, is usually assaulted when somebody, especially in, in low and middle income countries like ours, uh, is, um, is afflicted with any kind of disease. And uh, adding to that, if their pain is unrelieved, so the mental, emotional, social, spiritual, all of those, all of those kinds of distress build on one another. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll elaborate on that. But I think all of you are pretty on the mark and financial burden is also a huge one and we're gonna talk about that, okay. Um, Dr. Sankar Mitra, who's one of our associates, this is what he had to say, that the poor die in misery and neglect 
the middle class die in misery of ignorance and the rich die in the misery on die in misery on ventilators no one gets a pain free and dignified death in our country and this is a one man's opinion but also there is another you know saying by one of our friends uh, dr roop gursahani who some of you might know he's one of the leading advocates for appropriate end of life care in india and he says that modern healthcare uh, modern infrastructure and hospitals are like fortresses where the poor can't get in and the rich can't get out and uh, i don't know how you can compare the two is the man who is dying at home without any sort of technology or medicine is he luckier because he's surrounded by his loved ones or is the man who is hooked up to 10000 machines in an icu getting allegedly the best care but in a cold place with you know monitors going off listening to other people's agony and not having enough time with his or her family uh, is he luck is is that person lucky um so it's a it's a it's a it's a tough it's a tough call isn't it so let me ask you for a second what does what does a good death look like to all of you if i were to ask you today where would you like where would you like your death to take place and in of course in our society it's it's very inauspicious or abshagun to talk about it but we're going to talk about it a lot in this room so uh be prepared for that um let me ask one question at a time where would you like to die at home or in the hospital not on the bed in three okay uh, at home okay at home all right at home ma'am no. all right at home okay okay uh there was a study that was done among at home at home there was a study done among physicians asking the same question 99% of physicians said at home and yet we find that we uh we encourage people to to admit themselves to hospitals when when you know when the time comes okay um would you like to have every possible intervention okay personally ma'am i would like to go without too much of you know putting me through too much of treatment if i have to go i just want to go you know i don't want to struggle to hold back okay thank you thanks priyanka all right a slightly dissenting or different view i know everyone says home i don't mind where i'm located so long as my loved ones are around me and so long as it's not an icu i mean it could be a hospital room i'm okay with that i'm really actually okay with that to be very honest i mean i know i should be saying home because i work in palliative care <laughs> but what i want is my loved ones around me if they're around my hospital bed i'm okay with that because they may feel a little more reassured if i'm in a hospital room i don't know just a thought No, absolutely and, and there there are no uh, shoulds in <laughs> in this session so every everyone's opinion and i think you made a very fair point sometimes it's also you know what is distressing to the carers and what they are witnessing sometimes it's not possible to control the symptoms at home that there are what we uh, call intractable or refractory symptoms that can, that do need some sort of intervention that that can only be provided by a medical person so yes there there are those in between so talking about an ideal situation where it can be managed i think most of us would like to go at home but the reality is that most of us will need some sort of medical management there's a pre uh depressing statistic that only 10 to 15 of percent of us will die a sudden death so about 85% of us are going to have a protracted illness and um, you know we i said this in another forum i mean this is the kind of stuff that palliative care people keep saying right so we're very popular at parties so please invite us we will talk to all your guests about stuff like this i saw somebody's hand go up a little bit earlier i'm sorry i missed i missed who it was was it uh, isha mishif do you want to share something yeah i was talking about the sudden death i'd prefer that at one family before that instead of me dying suddenly and then suddenly not being there I mean I think most people prefer that. Yeah. I think most people ideally would like to die in their sleep at home <laughs> uh with as as little uh, trouble as possible for themselves and their families. Very very ideal setting. Yes Geeta please go ahead. 
Gita ma'am, can you unmute from your end? Yeah, I just wanted to share about my husband. Uh, I just come back from my holiday and he was suffering from a neuralgia disease where his nerves were very compromised and he didn't want to go to the doctor and uh, we tried our best to do everything at home for them, but he pushed me to go for a holiday to see my daughter and the day I came back on August 31st, that's just four months back. I found him breathing bad and he just died in my arms, like literally three hours after I came home. So when I said at home, like it's also the point I'm making is it's just not my decision. It's also respecting your spouse's decision that he said, you put me in a home, what happens? I've been in the ICU, I can't even see you. I can't even talk to you, which is true. So that's the reason that I mean, I've just lost him recently. It's just been four months. So I know the choice I made, whether it's right or wrong, but I know that he's at peace. So I don't know if that helped, but. It does, it does. thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so thank much. You. And um, we're so sorry for your loss. And um, seems quite trite to say that, but um, I really appreciate you coming here so, so raw in, uh, yeah. in a loss. Um, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much. It's not easy, but I really respect uh, it when people are able to be vulnerable with others like this. And I think our greatest learning comes from that. Uh, you are an expert. I will be leaning on you uh, over the next few weeks, Geeta. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, some Yes, somebody else uh, wanted to say something. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit slow today. Yes, please go ahead. Please unmute. All right. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, they're having trouble unmuting, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue, and if if they're able to unmute, then all right. Okay. So moving on. Um, uh, the Lian Foundation is uh, is an organization in, in in Singapore, and in 2015, as well as in 2010, they commissioned. Um, the the economist intelligence unit to conduct what is now called the quality of death index i want you to look at this side of the screen i know it's very tiny uh, you know font of the 80 countries that were surveyed india ranked 67 and the quality of death index looks into various things it looks into things like infrastructure it looks into things like training it looks into things like availability of palliative care and pain relief. And we have scored very, very low. The topmost countries are countries from the global north, what we call the global north, countries that, well, earlier you could call them first world countries or whatever, but UK, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland. So the top few countries are all the global north countries, developed countries, so to speak. And you'll find the global south countries actually come here. Um, we're gonna explore that a little bit more. It's not just a, a case of economics. And, um, and we, we, will, we will discuss that a little further down the line. Okay, we were talking about why people choose to end their lives and many of you talked about financial burden. This is a study that came out in 2017. It was also published in the Lancet. Out of pocket health expenditure pushes 55 million Indians below the poverty line every year. That is every year, 55 million Indians are impoverished because of healthcare expenses. In the study, we are also told that out of these 55 million people, 38 million people are pushed below the poverty line because of the cost of medicine. What kind of a healthcare system are we talking about that inflicts more suffering on a patient at a time when they are uh, at, their, at their most vulnerable? It's something for us to think about. Okay, 55 million Indians. And we, does everybody here know the poverty line? 32 rupees. It hasn't been revised in my opinion, 32 rupees a day. If you earn 32 rupees a day and below that, that's the poverty line. 
um, I mean, there are there's there's a lot of literature out there on on what defines the poverty line, and there is a different there's a different level for you know for 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 urban statistics and for rural statistics. But uh, my question is, thirty two rupees a day. I don't think it's the poverty line. Some might say it's the starvation line. It's it's <laughs> you can't survive on that much money now. If the study says that healthcare is pushing 55 million people below the poverty line every year, we really have something seriously wrong going on. Okay, and uh, and it's not just about insurance schemes. It's not just about reimbursable packages. It's not just about that. There's a lot of other things going on, and that is why palliative care is also important from that perspective because we are a pretty low cost um, response to this crisis. Okay, um, so. That's as far as the financial burden is concerned. It is a very real thing. It is, it is, effect, it is, it is affecting our country at a massive scale. Okay, now there is something called the Astana Declaration. Uh, Astana is the capital of Kazakhstan. And in 2018, uh, they had a meeting there and that is where they talked about the different tenets of universal health coverage. Universal health coverage is one of the sustainable development goals of the world. That someday people will have uh, quality health. So this is the this is what universal health coverage means. Quality health care should reach people where they are, when they need it, at an affordable cost. So quality, accessibility, timeliness, and affordability. These are the tenets of universal health coverage. It also goes on to say that health for all has to be health with all and that we have to include people in the designing and controlling of health systems because it is the user who knows what they need. And we have to include communities, we have to include people, we have to include people with lived experience in designing these policies. This is all very utopian, we're very far from it, but it is a step in the right direction. And I would go so far as to say that palliative care has been doing this for a very long time. Okay, how we've been doing it, uh, I'll share with you in just a few minutes. I want to first spend some time on this case. This is um, this is something that came out in the newspapers in uh, August 2016, where this this man and this woman had actually moved the the the, the court uh, to seek euthanasia for their four year old son. And the reason they stated was that their son was in such excruciating pain that they couldn't bear to see him in it. And so they would prefer to have him euthanized. He was denied that request, of course. Uh, euthanasia is not legal in our country. And uh, we're gonna spend some time talking about that as well. But in, uh, in the meanwhile, he went to various hospitals. Now, when we read this article, we wanted to track this family down. And so different palliative care organizations across South India got together and really started looking out for him. We found that they had gone to every major city in South India. They'd gone to Chennai, they had gone to Bangalore, they had gone to um, uh, Hyderabad. And it was really sad because in Hyderabad, they were actually at a hospital that was a stone's throw away from one of India's only children's palliative care centers, and they were not referred to them. Finally, we found them in, a, in an ICU in Bangalore, and a social worker took a prescription of uh, pain relief opioids from Hyderabad, written out by a pediatric palliative care physician, went overnight to this hospital, was denied entry, the child was denied the medication, and he died um, ex in excruciating pain. So this is a terribly sad story, but there are other stories where there was one in Kerala, which is the leading state for palliative care in the country, where the, the couple not only took their son's life, but then took their own after that. And where did this happen? It happened in a hospital. So again, uh, why am I highlighting a story like this? It's not to, you know, just uh, make us all feel worse. It's to tell you that this is the reality of what is happening. And uh, we talk about, you know, many people have asked us about euthanasia and is, does palliative care, I've been asked this question, does, does palliative care support euthanasia? Does it condone euthanasia? We absolutely do not. Uh, palliative care is not the same as euthanasia. Palliative care does not seek to hasten death. Uh, and we certainly don't uh, support euthanasia in that sense. Uh, why I'm also telling you the story is that 
before we talk about self-determination and you know, legalizing euthanasia and all of those things, we have to first consider the fact that we have not given adequate pain relief to our, to our, uh, to our country. And why do people seek euthanasia? Why do people choose to end their lives? A majority of them would like to have their, end, their suffering put to an end. We have the means to actually alleviate that suffering. So till such a time as we um, implement this, there are policies, there is a national program for palliative care at the center, which is yet to be implemented in majority of the states in India. It is there. Kerala has, uh, Kerala has implemented it. We've even gone through a revision in 2019. Karnataka has implemented it. Maharashtra has one on paper. I don't know of any other states. Uh, sorry, Orissa has a, has a great palliative care policy. That's it. Now you have a national policy for palliative care under the flexi pool, you have a budget where states can, can get that budget and actually roll out palliative care services in their country and yet we don't do it. It was in 2019 that elements of pain relief, end of life care and something called attitude ethics and communication were even introduced in the medical undergraduate curriculum of India. Till 2019, medical students were not being taught pain relief in a systematic way. You were not taught about communication, you were not taught about at attitude and can you, I mean, ethics um, and end of life care. 2019, the Medical Council of India started, I mean, they introduced this. That's great, but who is going to teach it? There are not enough qualified people to teach these subjects. So we are actually running a parallel program where we are training trainers to, to teach these in medical colleges, and we have made some progress. But by and large, this is a systemic problem. This is a systemic problem. It is not just a lack of training amongst doctors. It is a lack of policy implementation, and there is certainly lack of demand. Now, I have had extremely well-traveled, well-read people come and say, if I ask for palliative care, if I ask for morphine, is it legal? Am I asking for something illegal? And that is still a very, very prevalent myth. So we will, uh, we will need to dismantle that myth as well, which we will, we will, will, will um, dedicate an entire session to. But uh, there is the, uh, the issue that is going on in the Supreme Court of India at the moment, which is the Aruna Shanbar case, where the Supreme Court of India recognized the living will as a document, as a valid document, but they laid out procedures that are frankly impossible uh, if you want to enforce your living will. And the one big, I mean, the one thing that is quite fundamentally wrong with that whole verdict is that the, the Supreme Court of India used the phrase passive euthanasia to define withholding and withhold, uh, withdrawing of futile treatments. Now, if a ventilator, some of you talked about ventilation, if a ventilator is gonna do me no good, if I'm not going to come back to a certain quality of life and I choose to withdraw it or withhold it, the Supreme Court of India has called it passive euthanasia. No other country in the world causes it, calls it passive euthanasia. It's just called withholding and withdrawing of futile life support. By calling it passive euthanasia, it has clubbed the two together, which has led to this huge misconception that withholding, withdrawing, or you know, not having uh, um, extraordinary measures, et cetera, is the equivalent of euthanasia. So I would like to just sit with you for this moment and please clarify this point, that there is no such thing as passive euthanasia. Euthanasia is only one which is actively terminating somebody's life with a drug. We do not do that in palliative care. We do recommend that if it is not going to improve your quality of life, do not put more burden on the system by going through you know, more aggressive treatments and so on. That is not the same as euthanasia. So I'm just gonna put this down here for a minute. And if there are any, any reflections or questions anybody has, uh, we'll take it now. If, if I don't hear any questions, then I'll, I'll move on in a, in a few seconds. Isha, please. Madam, in Kerala, we have a palliative care in 2008, not in 1998, as you said. I think so. Please clarify. 2008 was our first policy. 2019 was our revision, uh, Mr. Ajay. No, no, madam. It is 2008. 
Yeah, but we had a revision of the policy in 2019. Okay. Has the term passive euthanasia been challenged? Is this a... Uh... We are challenging it. Yes, there's a group of people who are challenging it. Uh, some people might say it's just semantics, you know, let it be, but I don't think it's, it's just semantics because it really, really muddies the waters. And it, I know a lot of people um, are afraid to ask for palliative care simply or afraid to have that conversation with a doctor about withholding extraordinary measures because of this particular confusion that this wording causes. I mean, for those people who are aware of it, yes. It is being challenged, Sonia. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, please, Gita. Uh, what about DNR? DNR, do not resuscitate. So that is part of your advanced directives, uh, which is part of a larger thing of advanced care planning. Now your living will, if it says DNR, like the Supreme Court, like, like I've said, the Supreme Court recognize it, uh, recognizes it as a valid document. But, and so just to give you some sense of it, if you um, write out your DNR or if you write out your living will, um, you have to submit one with your local municipal officer. It says uh, they will determine who will be the custodian. Uh, you have to submit one with the first class, I mean, judicial magistrate first, first class. If you are, say, I'm from Tamil Nadu uh, and something happens to me in Bangalore and I want to invoke it, the treating the, the hospital that I'm, that I'm at has to convene a committee that will come and examine me. They will say, okay, it's futile, let's not do it. They will then get in touch with my district collector in Nilgiris. That collector has to then convene a committee from there to examine me. And then the first class judicial magistrate from there has to come and examine me. And that's when it will happen. So I was saying in another setting, have you even tried to get a house plan approved? which is something that people do all the time, it takes months. Something like this is not going to happen. Uh, it's not going to happen. But um, having said that, there is value in writing out your DNR and your advanced care planning so that your family knows what you want. Yeah. There's a lot of um, value in that. In fact, we, we've dedicated one whole session on advanced care planning with Dr. Rup Gursani for you uh, towards the end of the series. And he is, I mean, they're doing phenomenal work in this area and uh, he'll take you through the document. He'll tell you what it, what it means, um, how they arrived at these things. What are some of the medical legal issues that you might encounter? And there's a bunch of us who are working on this sort of debt literacy because unless there is, a deeper understanding amongst lay people. Uh, we cannot really uh, make a lot of steps. Uh, we can't move, make any progress as far as the legal fraternity or the bureaucratic system is concerned. Uh, but we are doing a session with you on that. Thank you. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna move ahead. All right, now, We've talked about healthcare. We've talked about the abysmal, uh, you know, uh, gaps. We've talked about some pretty sad stuff, and we've talked about where we stand on euthanasia. Now let's talk about what palliative care really is. Okay. Firstly, there's a myth that palliative care is only for people dying of cancer. This is absolutely not true. Palliative care can benefit patients and their families from the time of diagnosis of any life-limiting or life-threatening condition. Myth number two, palliative care means giving up and that there is no more hope for me. Here again, hope is really about futile interventions. Okay, we're not taking away hope. We're saying, we're, we're trying to determine what is futile and what will still enhance quality of life or maintain quality of life. And it is really about that quality of life and, uh, and maintaining it for as long as possible. So it's not about death, it is about a meaningful life. Palliative care hastens death, it does not. It provides comfort and best quality of life from diagnosis till the end of life, okay? So it does not hasten death. We've had people who are care recipients, who've been palliative care recipients for over 10 years with us. People living with disabilities, people living with other conditions, people living with spinal cord trauma. And uh, we've, as their illness trajectory has changed, we have accompanied them accordingly. 
pain is part of serious illness and dying and therefore does not need to be really treated separately. I mean, this is, again, if you look at how the medical curriculum was, was um, positioned till 2019, pain was taught in the medical, it, it was part of the medical curriculum, but it was a non-examinable subject. So when something becomes a non-examinable subject, it means it's not in, important enough for you to study. It's not going to come as a question in your question paper. So why will you bother studying it, right? So the subliminal message you get there is treating pain is not important. Um, and pain does not have to be a part of illness. And we have a whole lot of ways to alleviate pain, but somehow, you know, we say, no, this treatment is going to cause you this kind of distress. You're going to have to live with it because at least we're curing the underlying disease. No pain can be controlled and it must be controlled. Morphine is administered to, to hasten death. I cannot tell you how many people have asked me this question. Oh, oh my God, you're saying morphine. So that means, that means, uh, you know, he's on his way out and is it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bring the end in faster. It, it does not do that. And appropriate doses of morphine keeps patient comfortable, does not hasten death. Uh, I can speak from a personal standpoint. My mother is living with a serious uh, lung issue. She has chronic breathlessness, and it is only morphine that has alleviated her breathlessness. And uh, it has not hastened anything. It has kept her comfortable. It's the only thing that is able to keep her active and uh, you know, not spiral out into, in, into a crazy breathlessness cycle. Okay. Um, taking pain medication and palliative care leads to addiction. Appropriate doses of morphine and any opioid used with training and understanding does not lead to addiction. Okay. So the drug itself, okay, a lot of people think opioids they all, you know, it's derived from opium, therefore it must be addictive. There's no two ways around it. I've had doctors tell me, no, let's not get, you know, into the opioids bit right now. Let's wait till later. Um, appropriate appropriate um, prescription by people trained in it, I can guarantee you will not lead to addiction. Now we, ha we have safeguards for this immediate release oral morphine is something that you, it's a tablet that you take, it is ingested, it does not give you a rush, it is absorbed through the system if it's given in the right doses, it alleviates the pain, the breathlessness, and uh, excessive doses might make you a little drowsy, the side effect is constipation, but all of those things can be handled. Uh, we do not give people IV, which is intravenous morphine to take back home, because there is a higher risk there of injecting. Uh, by somebody who doesn't need it, okay? And um, and we will talk about what is happening in the US, the opioid crisis that is happening in the US, because that is the narrative that everybody hears. And that is one of the biggest reasons why people believe that opioids are addictive and therefore they must not be used. We will talk about that as well. Okay, now palliative care care is the active holistic care of individuals across all ages with serious health related suffering uh, due to illness and especially of those near the end of life it aims to improve the quality of life of patients their families and their caregivers so if you look at this diagram um, this is where palliative care can begin and you're seeing this trajectory increase over a period of time so yes palliative care becomes more and more necessary towards the end of life but it is something that that is given a support that ideally should be given a supportive care right through the illness trajectory now while most interactions with healthcare workers will end here palliative care also has a role in bereavement support for the family so it goes beyond the death of the index patient and uh, looks after the family as a unit as well okay so this is one way of looking at palliative care another way of looking at palliative care is this People have a life-limiting condition, and all of this comes under the ambit of palliative care. From the time they have a life-limiting illness, and by life-limiting, I mean something that you can live with for a very long time, but it prevents you from doing a few things. Um, examples, any examples that people can share with me? What are some life-limiting, but not necessarily life-threatening conditions? Any thoughts? Parkinson's. Diabetes. Parkinson's, Parkinson's diabetes, asthma. Asthma, yeah. Old age, but dialysis, fine. CRF, yeah. Chronic renal failure, 
um, blood pressure. Yeah. Um, you also have autoimmune conditions. You have degenerative conditions. Um, I mean, people living with disabilities, that is a life limiting condition. People living with, a, you know, a, who've had a car crash, who've had some sort of trauma to their spine. These are all life limiting conditions that can benefit from palliative care. And we have enough and more evidence of that right here in Pallium India. Uh, you might have a terminal illness, which is, you know, like maybe cancer, advanced cancer, or advanced uh, lung disease, or, uh, or, you know, end stage renal failure, and so on and so forth. HIV. Yes, HIV. We have lots of people here who are working in HIV who know a lot about that. And then there is something called pre-active dying and active dying. And the active dying period is a shorter period. It is when the person, you know, this is the person physically starts to shut down. And there are some markers telling us that they are towards the end, the very end of their lives. So all of this are areas in which palliative care has a role to play. And uh, here's something that we created this year. This is something that we created at Pallium India. A lot of people believe that, pal uh, that palliative care is end of life care, but really palliative care is this, this whole beautiful picture of there is community support. There is interdisciplinary care from a, like a multidisciplinary team, doctor, nurse, physiotherapist, uh, social worker, psychologist, um, neurologists even. I mean, th there's pulmonologists. Uh, there's pain relief and symptom management, other symptoms, the psychosocial and spiritual support. We don't, we, don't, we don't just treat the disease and the physical aspect. We also work with the psychosocial, spiritual aspects. Uh, we prepare the family and the person for death if that is necessary. Uh, we, there's a lot of emphasis on family and caregiver support because the illness of one person has a huge effect on the family. It impacts their ability to um, provide education to their children, it impacts the way in which their lifestyle uh, uh, is led, it impacts um, livelihood. Now, we have enough and more cases where the breadwinner gets seriously sick, the primary caregiver is somebody who also has to quit their job and come home and stay at home and look after the person. Uh, we have families who have had to take their children out of school because that tuition fee or that education fee is then rooted towards treatment. And what then happens is that the illness of one person has a multi-generational impact. There's loss of opportunity, there's loss of all kinds of things. And uh, so that sort of family and caregiver support is also really important. Restoration of dignity of the person and the family. Uh, we live, unfortunately, at a time when uh, being sick is also a very humiliating and demeaning experience. And part of the work that we do is to restore the personhood and the dignity of, of the patient. And empathetic communication is an overarching theme across all these domains. Every single one of these requires empathetic and compassionate communication. And so communication is an overarching uh, skill set of palliative care. And we believe in this concept of total pain. Um, total pain is when a patient reports his or her pain, like on the pain scale, one to 10, 10 being the highest, zero, one being the lowest. Uh, we ask all our patients, where are you on the pain scale? And if this person says, I'm at five, I'm at six, uh, we believe that it's not just the, the physical pain, there is a whole lot of other stuff going on that is contributing to this pain. It's compounding their pain. So here, let me just do a small thought experiment with all of you, yeah? I want you to just you know, put down what you're doing and um, humor me a little bit. I'd like you to imagine that it is a Sunday afternoon and um, you have this headache. And it's a headache that you get from time to time. I'm not talking about a migraine level headache. I'm talking about a headache that, you know, maybe because you didn't have enough water to drink or something. And it's a Sunday, um, you're at home. There is someone who cares about you, who's there with you. Um, you don't have, any major responsibilities, you're not at work, and uh, somebody makes you a cup of tea or brings you some warm water or some soup, gets you like, a, you know, gives you a foot rub or a head massage. And I'd like you to score that headache for me on a scale of one to 10. We've all experienced that headache. One to 10, what does that headache feel like? Given the circumstances that I have just described to you, you have someone to look after you, you have no major rush to do any work. You have some comfort food. Yeah, so I'm seeing two, three, four, two, three. Yeah. 
All right, you get the picture. Same headache now, same headache. Monday morning, three missed deadlines, uh, flat tire on the way to work, someone has cut you off. And those of us who are from Bangalore, we know how often we get into those scraps uh, on the road. Um, you had a fight with your spouse, your child has decided that they don't want to go to school today, they've thrown a tantrum and you get to work and your boss is mad at you because you're 20 minutes late and they're asking you about the assignment and you have not done it. Same headache, score it now. Same headache you had on Sunday, but now you've had it under these circumstances. Is it going to feel any different? Oh, ten <laughs> Seven, okay. Yep. So it has increased, hasn't it? Nine, ten, yeah, yeah. I would, I would, I would score it at that. So has the headache changed? No. The circumstances have changed under which you're experiencing the headache. Take that into 10x, 100x for somebody living with a serious illness. You're having to reallocate resources in your family. You're going to have to reallocate roles in the family. You're a, you may not be able to do things that you like to do anymore, all of those things. So every little bit of pain you're experiencing is going to feel that much worse, isn't it? So this is what we call total pain. And this is something, so even if the patient does not look like they have any physical symptoms of pain, like, you know, tight muscles or sweating or whatever. And if, they, if they're telling me their pain is nine on 10, my job then is to ask what is going on in your life? What is happening in your life that is causing you to experience this pain as a nine rather than a four? Yeah, so that is total pain. And that is how we're going to, uh, that's a major tool of assessment for us. So please bear this in mind. And someone tells you their pain, the, their, uh, the number on the pain scale, if it is on the higher side, ask them what is also going on with the rest of their lives, okay? All right, so that is the total pain concept. Okay, and it has many components, physical, psychological, socioeconomic, and spiritual. Physically, there could be issues like, okay, uh, I I, I'm now, I have incontinence or I have pain, I have nausea, I have, you know, hair loss, I have whatever different things. Psychological, it's a psychological impact on me as a person and how it has affected me in terms of my problem solving skills, my emotional coping skills, uh, socioeconomic the impact it has on, on my family, on my, on my family as a unit, on my ability to support myself, on my ability to support my family the impact that my family has, uh, has experienced as a result, and spiritual. Now, right through palliative care, any of these palliative care classes, you are going to hear about spiritual suffering. I want to qualify that it does not only mean religious faith. It does include it, but it's not only restricted to religious faith. By spirituality, we are talking about meaning, purpose, connectedness, and hope. And Various things can bring you meaning in life. Various things can give you a sense of purpose and connection. So those are the things. For some people, it's music. For some people, it's a sense of being able to be of service to other people. For some people, it's art, nature, whatever. And when I know for some people, it's the ability, their relationship with their pets. And when these things are hampered or, or derailed by an illness, there is deep spiritual suffering. And it's different for different people. Yeah, so I want you to please think about spiritual suffering in that context and not necessarily only in the religious context, which is something that, yes, for a lot of us, our faith is also important, but this applies to a uh, to, to, uh, vaster canvas. Okay, now, uh, very quickly also, uh, when we are looking at palliative care in the ethical framework in the Indian context, we go by the regular medical ethics, which is autonomy, beneficence, non-malfeasance and justice. Autonomy is the person's uh, right to decide for themselves. It's doing what is in their best interest uh, to do no harm, non-malfeasance uh, to, and, and to pro make sure that it is, there is social justice, there is equity and all of those things. In theory, theory and practice are the same, but in practice they are not. Okay, so we can talk about autonomy, beneficence, non-malfeasance and justice. It all sounds great, but in practice, it is not actually being done. And that is uh, something that we in palliative care are really, really focusing on equitable access to care. Uh, I'm just gonna share um, a video with you and I really hope I can get the tech right. So please bear with me for a second.
this is a video that is designed more for a Western, um, I would say more for a Western audience. And um, Raju, I'm gonna ask you to please help me. Um, I'm sure that my sound is coming through, yeah? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, just give me a thumbs up if the sound is coming through. You are a bridge. It's true, or at least it's a good analogy. Well, that was a pretty succinct sort of uh, description of palliative care. And uh, like I said, I'd like to emphasize that that's coming from a Western modality. And the needs for palliative care in India are greater. And that is because we do not have disease specific treatment. This, uh, you know, we don't receive uh, disease specific treatment in time or adequately in a lot of cases. Referrals are very uh, late. There are a lot of social, um, in, like there's a lot of social reasons why people present late as well. Uh, there's a huge intersectionality of gender and health seeking behavior in India. And women are the last to seek health uh, healthcare for themselves. Resources allocated to women within the family is also very less. And uh, so older people have issues, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of reasons why the, the need for palliative care becomes that much more extensive in a country like India or in a low and middle income country. Um, but having said that, we're now going to talk about why palliative care. We, we talked about what is palliative care. We're going to now talk about why palliative care. Um, firstly, this is the usual model. Here's the individual and here is the larger healthcare system, uh, usually represented by a tertiary care hospital. And there is this gap. Now, like I said in the beginning, we have this, uh, we have this problem, right? Where this here is a fortress where the poor can't get in and the rich cannot get out. So what happens to, what, what happens here? Now in Kerala, uh, we have the palliative care model, which we have um, leveraged the power of community. And the Kerala palliative care model is a celebrated model globally. It is, uh, it is considered to be the most successful community-based palliative care model in the world. And while I am very proud of it, uh, I also find that it, you know, as over the years, as I've been hearing about it, it's also a little bit uh, reductive because this is not the only model in that will work. And rather than transferring the Kerala model to other parts of the country, what I really encourage people to do is to translate elements of it into their own communities. What works in Kerala may not work in Meghalaya. What works in Kerala may not work in Maharashtra, but Maharashtra, Meghalaya, uh, Sikkim may have other strengths within the community. And I'll give you an example of that. Like in, um, it was in it was in Mizoram where, you know, there's a there's a very high uh, there's a high density of or there's a high number of people who are who are who are practicing Christians, and uh, for for some years we had some difficulty in in introducing the palliative care model and things like that. Uh, the Presbyterian Church, uh, which is uh, you know one of the most popular churches there, uh, they once a year they choose a subject to talk about. Um, it's on a Wednesday night. And that year they chose to talk about palliative care and the importance of palliative care. And what we saw was this incredible downward cascade going through all the other congregations across Mizoram, where suddenly everybody sad took an interest in this community-based model of palliative care, whereas the congregation, they would support each other in this particular arena. Now, that is something that worked there. It may not work in another state. But there are other states where other models have worked. So we're seeing a brilliant model coming up in Telangana where partnership between uh, an NGO and the government and professionals have made palliative care available in 33 districts or across Telangana. And uh, so I just want to highlight that the Kerala model is a fabulous model, but it may not be the model for everybody and that is okay. Let's look for models that will work within our own communities in our own settings. Okay, um, 
So I'm just going to talk about this because I'm from Pallium India, and uh, this has been a this has been a successful model for us. So we harness the power of community, and it has been a tremendous, tremendous uh, experience just to witness how the community has come together to support one another. And what we've done is we've created something called link centers. Now, let me tell you a little bit about how this works. Um, in the Trivandrum district, you have different panchayats, you have different you know, rural and uh, suburban and urban uh, uh, areas. Now, a link center is basically a public building, either a primary school, a library, or in some cases, even somebody's house that, uh, that becomes that physical infrastructure in that particular panchayat or in that particular community. What purpose does that link center serve? So we run this volunteer training program where people from the community come to train with us for a few days. And we teach them how to identify if somebody in their community would benefit from palliative care. Now that involves busting the myths. It's not only for cancer, it's for somebody who is bed bound. It could be for somebody who's a wheelchair user. It could be for somebody who has a um, autoimmune condition, so on and so forth. Um, and these volunteers receive this training, they go back into their communities and they become our eyes and ears because it is not possible for healthcare to be present everywhere. It is not possible. So communities who know their neighbors best. Now the link center is the place where the register is kept. And somebody says, hey, you know what? That lady over there, three houses down, she, she lives alone, her children live in another town and uh, she's had a fall, she's at, and there's no one to look after her, I'm gonna register her name in this link center. So the next time our home care team goes there, we're anyway seeing the people who we see regularly, but we now know that we also have to go and see this lady in her home. What you're seeing in this picture is a primary school that once a week becomes a link center for us. People who are able to come here to receive their medication and to be examined by a doctor, they come. But those people who cannot make it here are also our most vulnerable patients and their families. So what we do is we go to them. And a lot of the times these are through very, very difficult to navigate terrains. And uh, it's one of the reasons why patients can't come to us because of the physical terrain and the geographical isolation of where they live. So we go to them because if you remember universal health coverage, it's meeting people where they are when they need it. And um, we go to some of the most impoverished homes. These are people who have also been further impoverished by healthcare expenses. And this is a story I want to share with you. This young man here that you see, he had been in a, in a road accident a few years ago. And uh, you can see that he's a big guy. Okay, he's about 19 years old at, uh, when, when he had the accident. He lives alone with his mother. He has no father. His mother works in a plantation. When he had this accident, he became, um, he, he had extensive injuries. He, um, he had head injury. He had a head injury as well. Now, he was told that he needs to come into the hospital for physiotherapy every week. And that if he did that, he would show substantial, uh, significant improvement. Now, I want to tell you, this guy, he lives in a house which is on a hill. He has to walk down a hill, up another one, down another one to get to the main road, which does not have a regular bus, bus service to the, to the city. Um, if he has, he can't even na navigate the step that is a few inches high, stepping out from his veranda to his, uh, to his yard. If he has to go for physiotherapy, four men from the village have to take leave, come to his house, put him on a khatya or a chair or a stretcher, carry him this distance to the main road where his mother has to hire an auto rickshaw, which costs her week's salary to take him to the hospital, wait there and come back. So do you think this guy went for physiotherapy every week? He did not. So one of the volunteers in his community registered him in our link center. So we went to see him. And for the last many years, we have been giving him physiotherapy in his own home. He's been engaging actively with us. And I'm very happy to tell you that he has regained mobility. He is back to, you know, uh, and he was getting depressed. So in those three years, he had really de like deteriorated. His, he had gone into deep depression. He was alone at his house all day, every day till his mother came back. Now he is he's back on track. He's out of his depression. He's walking around a little bit with support. And what would have happened to him had the palliative care team not found him? So this is also palliative care.
it's not just for pain relief, it's not just for cancer, it is for anybody with a serious health related, uh, with any kind of serious health related suffering. Okay, need people where they are when they need it. Um, it's, we recognize that it's not just enough to provide free medical service and medicines to people when they don't have food to eat. What's the point of free medication if you're starving? So we also provide food kits, food rations for up to a month for families that are in dire financial crisis and cannot afford food. And uh, it's dry rations and, you know, and a few other things. So we have over 100 families at the moment that we're supporting with food. This is also palliative care because it is addressing serious health-related suffering. A lot of these families have lost their ability to feed themselves as a result of one person's illness. So when you talk about serious health-related suffering, it is suffering associated with, with the person's health, right? It's a different matter if they've made, I mean, if, I mean, if, if they've been at, in this position because of other reasons, but if they have been registered with us as a patient and we find that their illness has led them into this, into this situation where they can't afford to eat, we will support that. So that is also palliative care. This is what it looks like our home visits in, in a, lot of, a lot of times. Um, uh, these are the pathways we have to walk. And can you imagine people living with, with any kind of serious illness having to traverse this to get to a hospital? Um, so we really think it's important, and, and I know that everybody can't do it, but when you see a patient in the hospital versus seeing them in their home, then you truly get to know them. Sitting in a hospital prescribing medication and saying, okay, here you need to take this medication and you need to do this. Um, it's all well and good, but how often do we stop to think, how many people in this family are not going to eat a meal in order to be able to afford that prescription? If I'm telling Telling somebody to come for physiotherapy once a week, are they even physically able to do it like that boy? So there is a gap in healthcare when we are just looking at the disease and not the person and the family. It's only when you look at this bigger picture that you realize that your prescription is actually no good. Your prescription is actually causing them even more suffering. It's causing them even more pain. It is stopping their child from going to school. Can you highlight the role of occupational therapist? Yes, we will be doing that in the interdisciplinary team uh, discussion uh, next session, Dr. Ankita, is that okay? Yeah? All right, so, um, so, so that's, that's one of the things that we need to talk about. And we have this wonderful uh, ally called Dr. Aju Matthew, who is a cancer specialist. I, I think some of you here have also encountered him. Um, he does something called a wallet biopsy which means that he, he's one of the finest um, medical oncologists I know. But he will tell you that, okay, listen, this is what you have. This is what might work for you, but this is how much it's gonna cost you over this period of time. Can you afford it? And because I want you to think about that, at what cost are you going to be able to afford it? He really sits with patients and helps them think this through because Prescribing eight rounds, I mean, three rounds of chemo, six you know, cycles of radiation is easy to do. But at what cost is the family going to be able to do it is very, very important. So that's what he calls a wallet biopsy. Now, this is not to say that if you can't afford it, you should not have good treatment. I don't want to say that, okay? That's not what we're saying, that if you can afford only this much, then you have to have like really cheap, you know, less than ideal care, it's not that. But it's really to help people think through the process because six months down the line, I'm doing the fifth round of chemo, but I've had to sell my, my house to do it. Yeah, and what is the outcome going to be? We don't know. So that's, that's something that we need to think about. And that is, that is an approach that we also take. It's part of the whole shared decision-making um, you know, aspect of the work we do. Okay, I'm mindful of the time, so I'm gonna move ahead. Um, what we also do is vocational rehabilitation. We find that very often, and this is, this is tied not just to livelihood and economics, it is tied to a sense of self and dignity. If I have, like this man on the right, and by the way, all of this is with consent. This man on the right had, had been in a road accident. Uh, he was uh, paraplegic. And suddenly from being the breadwinner and being the decision maker, he's just sitting at home. And you know, his sense of self was really diminished. So he himself, like we had a bunch of things that we offered and he chose to become an umbrella maker. And 
hey, Kerala, that's something we always need. We always need an umbrella. So he, he started making umbrellas and he was able to contribute to his household income, which made him feel better about himself. He was not at the mercy of his other family members. And this gave back some sense of dignity and autonomy to him. Uh, a caregiver, very often we find that women, and I'm talking about, you know, 80% uh, of women across the world are caregivers. I mean, 80% of caregivers around the world are women, sorry. 80% of caregivers around the world are women. It falls upon women to stay home and take care of somebody. We also see this thing happening where a woman gives birth to a child with a congenital anomaly, like say, bell, like just like I don't know, cerebral palsy or Down syndrome or something of that sort. And she's considered cursed. She's considered to be unlucky. And we have a lot of cases where women like that have been abandoned. And you suddenly have a young woman with a child who has high dependency needs and uh, she cannot support herself. So what happens to her? She has to be at home all the time. So we have a system where we enable her to earn for herself too, through cottage industry and then linking her to other services. So vocational rehabilitation is not just essential for the economics of the family, the economic or financial health of the family. It is also important in other ways. Autonomy, being able to support yourself, being a contributing member of your family and of society, and also uh, preventing maybe, you know, uh, falling into, uh, into ways of supporting yourself that you ideally wouldn't have wanted to do. So vocational rehabilitation, in my opinion, is also palliative care. And children are a big part of uh, the work that we do now. And, uh, you know, restoring a child's sense of dignity is also very important. We've had a lot of children transition from our children's palliative care program into our adult palliative care program. Many of them have grown up with us. And uh, it has been, you know, child enhancement, child life enhancement is really important because it's when a, when a child is sick, it's very easy to forget that they're also children and they need to be engaged. A child needs the medication, sure. They also need toys. They need to feel like children. They need to be able to play. And that is something that is a very important aspect of the work that is, uh, that is happening. Um, we ran a toy donation drive once for children in our program living with various life-limiting, life-threatening conditions. And for a lot of people, I found that, you know, uh, people who didn't want to engage with, like, oh God, palliative care is so depressing. Oh God, children's palliative care must be even more tragic. But they were happy to send toys across. They were happy to engage with us on something that they see that they saw as positive. And I think that's really important because palliative care is not about death and dying. It is about living well. And for children, play is such an important part of that. Um, we currently support over 400 children, um, their education. And these are children who, uh, whose families were financially destroyed by disease. And... Um, Without this educational support, a good number of them would have dropped out of school and their lives would, taken, would have taken on a different track. I'm very pleased to tell you that uh, I think quite a few of them have gone on to become nurses and doctors. And uh, that's just one way of paying it forward. So um, educational support is also palliative care. And uh, special attention to elderly people, uh, especially, you know, elderly people who live alone. Kerala alone has 1,76,000 uh, elderly people living alone, of which uh, 1,30,000 are women. And, uh, you know, there is, there is suffering brought on by pain. There is suffering brought on by uh, physical distress. There is intense suffering brought on by loneliness and frailty. And uh, they are very... I mean, they are deserving of, uh, of, of care as much as the other person. And so palliative care, we pay special attention to uh, older people and we have a geriatric assessment scale. And this also includes that if we have a patient who say in their forties, we go home, we find that he has an elderly parent, we will assess the parent because uh, we assess them on, on, on parameters like vision, mobility, uh, you know, basic blood tests and stuff, because if tomorrow something were to happen to them, if they were risk, if they're at risk for a fall, if something happens to them, then you're stuck with two patients at home and no one to care for either of them. So geriatric assessment is not just restricted to our patients, but also to elderly people in the homes of our patients. And prevention is also um, palliation. Okay, uh, very quickly, a huge part of the work that we do is advocacy. 
Now, this is really important because um, there are policies and, and laws and guideline, guidelines being determined globally for people uh, in palliative care. A lot of these decisions are made by people in developed global North countries and are not really fit for purpose in our, in our countries. So it's very, you know, you have laws like, or you have policies like, well, yeah, as long as you have a law that um, takes into consideration palliative care, you're fine. No, we know in our country that a law can be in place, but it will not be enlivened unless you individually work with state governments. India has a concurrent healthcare system where you have the central government and states. You can have a law passed at the central government level, but it's up to the states how they want to implement it. And a classic example of that is the Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act, which covers access to opioids. So I love this thing. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So you have to get in there, you have to say your piece. And the voices of the global South are very different from developed countries. So we have to have a place at the table. As of last year, Pallium India got a consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council, which gives us a voice at the UN. And uh, we're still learning the ropes, but uh, we're hoping to put it to good use. Um, this is a map that I want you to look at very carefully. This was a map that became the signature of the Lancet Commission on Global Access to Pain Relief and Palliative Care in 2018. Now, what is this map showing you? It is showing you access to opioids for pain relief in different countries by their um, by the proportion. So Canada, USA, Australia, all engorged because they use up the most amount of opioids for, for pain relief. Global South countries, India, Africa, I mean, we've disappeared off the map. That tells us how little access we have to medication. A lot of the raw material for the medicine comes from our countries, and yet we don't have access to our own medicines. This is very, very important for us to keep in mind because if you want pain relief for somebody in your family, understand that global dynamics determine how much access you have. And therefore we have to speak up, okay? 75% of the world remains without access to proper pain relief. Asia's morphine per capita consumption is 36 times less than the global average, okay? And the sad part is that majority of the people in need of palliative care are in these countries and we don't get it. Um, the war on drugs was declared by America in the 70s and 80s. It was politically motivated. I won't get into it right now. We'll do another session on it. But it sent a, this ripple effect around the world where people had to, I mean, had to sign on to these treaties and things. And India was one of those countries that in, in response came up with the Narcotic Drugs and Psych Psych Psychotropic Substances Act of 1985. From the day it came into effect, till the year 1997, we saw a 97% drop in the amount of morphine that was being consumed in the country for pain relief. And that means the pain burden in our country went up 97%. We, as one of the largest manufacturers of legal opium in the world, did not have access to pain relief as a result of this law. We fought for 19 years to have this law amended. Uh, several palliative care, Groups came together <laughs> 19 years in the, last, uh, in the last session of parliament under the Congress government, it was the last bill to be passed. And I will never forget that day because uh, had it not been passed in that supplementary session, we would have had to start the advocacy work all over again. Uh, at 5.30, when the last supplementary session of the parliament ended, we all thought, okay, we've lost this. At 5.35, we got a message saying, the bill has been passed and you now have access to opioids for pain relief in the country. And I still get goosebumps thinking about it because it was a very, very hard one fight. Okay, now, very quickly, the single convention is, uh, these are the treaties uh, that globally determine access to pain relief. And the 1961 single convention is what we're all under. The International Narcotics Control Board was formed under the single convention. And according to the single convention, we have a dual response we have to prevent the abuse of opioids and we have to make opioids available for those in pain. Unfortunately, I mean, and if you're looking at it, 
prevention and diversion of illicit use, which is what you're hearing about, you know, the Shah Rukh Khan son's case, all of that, the NDPS, it's all this, international laws of criminal justice. But on the other side of this is international laws of human rights, which tells you that these have to be available for medical and scientific purposes. Nobody talks to you about this box. Everybody's only talking about this. And this is a huge problem because if you only focus on this, you have these many more people who are suffering and in pain. Um, and we will we'll get into that in a session on substance use disorders and global dynamics on addiction. Um, to close, I'm just gonna share this picture with you. This is a man who lived with cancer pain and spent most of three weeks in this position. He was one of our patients. One tablet of immediate release oral morphine later, he was able to sit up and have a cup of tea for the first time in three weeks. This is what we are denying people. Three rupees worth of medicine. So uh, this is what we're advocating for. International advocacy on our, on our part is about this, that these medicines are available. They can be used safely. Why are we not using it? And uh, I'll skip this slide. So a good health system delivers quality service to all people when and where they need them. And palliative care is an integral part of that. And um, very quickly, when you encounter you know, your healthcare system, please remember that there are three levels of clinical decision-making. One is medical information. You have cancer, you have X, Y, Z ailment. These are the medicines. Uh, these are the, stu the studies show that these medicines work, this intervention works. That's medical information. There is paternalistic information plus recommendations. This is your diagnosis. These are the studies uh, that tell us that these medicines and these interventions work. My recommendation is this to you, okay? So it's information plus recommendation. What we truly want is this, where this is what you have, this is what is recommended. What would you like? Can you make this work? Are you able to afford it? And this is what we're aiming for. And this is a cornerstone of palliative care where we take into consideration people's values and preferences and not just prescribe uh, something to them. Okay, uh, I'm not, I'm gonna skip the slide for the moment. And I'm just gonna say that if we really want to make palliative care reality in our country, we need to not just think about one level, we need to think local, national, and international. And we need to create a large tent under which all of us come together public policymakers, professionals, and private sector. And we're all, we all have a role to play here. I'm gonna just, uh, I'm just gonna share one last thing with you uh, because this is, this is a video that was made for the African Palliative Care Association. But while I showed you the Western model of uh, palliative care in the, other, in the other video, I really want you to watch this one. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite videos about palliative care. And if I can get this right, hang on a second. Okay. I will leave you with that. And um, we're at the top of the hour. I, I welcome all of you again to this series. Um, thank you for a great start. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the sharing. I hope that as we go along, you will continue to do that. And as Raju has said, we do have case presentations. So please share cases with us. Um, we will try and incorporate them in future sessions. And I cannot wait to hear from all of you. Like I said, you will see a lot more of me, uh, but uh, keep your questions coming in. And if you have any concerns at any point, you can reach out to our technical team. Uh, they're fantastic at problem solving. So I look forward to getting to know all of you. Have a great afternoon and uh, see you next time.